Hi, and welcome back to Psychology with me, Mr. Snyder. And today we are going to discuss the control center of our entire body, the brain. Our learning targets, we'll talk about the parts of the brain, their functions, how we group them and how we classify them. Then we'll move on to discuss specifically the cerebral cortex. And lastly, we'll talk about the five methods that we use to research the brain. So our first part of the brain is the hindbrain. And you can see the three classifications of it, the hindbrain, midbrain, and forebrain. The parts of the hindbrain, you, if you think of it from an evolution standpoint, in, uh, evolved first. So these are our most basic bodily functions. The medulla here uh, on the brainstem is involved in a person's heart rate, blood pressure, and breathing. The pons, the part above the medulla on the brain stem, regulates body movement, attention, sleep, and alertness. And some of these things, they work together. And then the cerebellum is on the back of the brain. It literally means little brain. It is involved in a person's balance and coordination. So if any of these, person, if these things were damaged, or if a person gets hit in the back of the head, it's very serious because it could damage these and threaten the person's life. The midbrain, we're only going to be talking about one part of the midbrain, uh, but it's involved with vision and hearing, and it's called the reticular activating system. This is what gets your attention if uh, you need to wake up out of a sleep or if you need to focus on something. Uh, it increases your heart rate, your blood pressure, and your brain activity. It wakes you up. Uh, it arouses you from slumber or from inattention. That's the reticular activating system. The forebrain are where most of the parts are, and that's where we're going to focus. The forebrain is where complex thinking processes take place. The thalamus is a relay station. Think of this as the uh, train station where all the trains, all the sensory information is coming into, and then the train depot or the thalamus sends it all out to where it needs to go in the higher levels of the brain. So it's a relay station. Every sense goes through there except for smell. The hypothalamus, hypo means under. It's a very small thing located under the thalamus, but it's very, very important. It regulates uh, body temperature, the storage of nutrients. Uh, it's involved in motivation and emotion, hunger, thirst, sexual behavior, uh, caring for your offspring, and aggression. So it's it's a very, very primitive part of the brain, but it's very important in some of our most basic functions. The limbic system in the brain is kind of around the brain stem area toward the back, and it's involved in learning and memory. Uh, also plays a role in emotion, hunger, sex, and aggression. Uh, it's around the brain stem. The cerebrum is the large part of the brain. It's what you think of when you think of a brain. It makes up about 70% of the brain's weight, and it's where our most conscious and intellectual activities take place. And the surface is covered in wrinkles and edges so that you can pack more neurons into the area. And that area, that outer core, is called the cerebral cortex, cortex being the Latin for bark. This is the part that thinks in us and it deals with planning, memory, language, complex emotional skills and complex motor skills, uh, the perception of our sensations that our uh, sensory neurons take in. This is all done in the cerebral cortex and it's the outer layer of the cerebrum and it was probably the last to develop evolution wise that's why it's the most high functioning part that we have. So here's a look at all of those uh, things that we talked about. The pituitary gland also in there. The master gland basically controls your growth. Um, but that is what the brain looks like, and there's all of the parts. We'll talk about the corpus callosum here in a little bit. Here, let's divide up the cerebral cortex into different parts. The cerebral cortex has a left side and a right side. We call each side a hemisphere. The corpus callosum is the band of fibers that connects the two hemispheres. So it's two connecting hemispheres with a band of fibers in between them connecting them. 
Here's something else that's important to know. Information received by one side of the body is transmitted to the opposite hemisphere of the brain. So if you touch something with your right hand, that is transferred to the left side of your brain. Each hemisphere, as you can see, is divided into four parts. We have your frontal lobe. And this is the large part in front. This is where your decision making, planning, problem solving, movement, all of that stuff happens. Your parietal lobe is right behind your frontal lobe and that is what integrates all of your sensory information. And so your par uh, parietal lobe can be divided up into motor cortex or your primary motor cortex and your primary somasensory cortex. The temporal lobe on your temples right here are next to your ears. That is where hearing and auditory information is processed. And the occipital lobe doesn't make any sense, but it's in the back of your head. So sometimes if you get hit in the head or in the back of the head especially, you see stars. That's because your occipital lobe has been a little bit damaged. And that is in the back of your head. Uh, here you can see the motor and somasensory cortexes. Uh, basically, these are the parts of that cortex that control each body part. So in your motor cortex, you have uh, wrist, fingers, thumb, neck, brow, eye, face, lips. These are your movements, but then your somasensory are uh, hand, fingers, thumb, also eye, nose, face, stuff like that. Just different areas of the brain uh, do different things. And we know that we can stimulate electrically people's brains and watch them move different parts of their body. So that's how we know that this part of the brain does different things. Association areas of this cerebral cortex shape information into something meaningful. So instead of just seeing uh, eight-sided red object with white letters, we know that that is a stop sign. This is the brain's executive center, and these association areas also provide the core of our working memory or our short-term memory. This is where we store stuff that we're thinking about. Uh, the frontal region of the brain then retrieves this uh, visual, auditory, and other kinds of memories from our frontal lobe. Other association areas in the frontal lobe make it possible for language to happen. Language abilities in the brain, for nearly all right-handed people, language functions are based in the left hemisphere. And also about two out of every three left-handed people, it's also based in the left hemisphere. That's where all of your language and your thinking and your planning takes place in the left hemisphere. Wernicke's area and Broca's area are two places involved in our speech and our hearing. So Wernicke's area connects sights and sounds together. If a person has their Wernicke's area damaged, people find it difficult to understand speech. They may be able to speak fine, but they won't be able to understand you. Broca's area is involved in speech. With When this area is damaged, people speak slowly and use very simple sentences. They may be able to hear you fine, but if they speak, they will have trouble speaking. Left brain versus right brain people. The left brain is where our logic and science and math and all of this uh, higher order thinking skills happen. Uh, the right hemisphere is more concerned with a person's imagination, art, creativity, feelings, spatial relations. This is kind of an oversimplification of the idea. Both brain parts are uh, involved in each both parts of the brain are involved in creativity, in logic, but more so, they, they just tend to have different specializations. But uh, split brain operations, where they actually have to sever the corpus callosum between the two brains, teach psychologists a lot of what they know about this left and right hemisphere functioning. And then finally, here is how we study the human brain. We can study it through accidents or case studies like uh, Phineas Gage, accidents that kill or different parts of the brain and injure different parts of the brain provide opportunities to study how those different parts of the brain affect the person's uh, behavior.
lesions. We can create lesions in animals' brains and destroy part of the brain and see how that affects their behavior. We can also stimulate people's brains electrically. We can t uh, then find out which areas of the brain respond to visual, auditory, sensory stimulations. We can make people see stuff. We can make people hear stuff simply by stimulating their brain. An EEG or an electroencephalogram will uh, basically hook you up there like in picture number four and enables researchers to measure electrical activity in the brain and diagnose certain disorders. And then finally, brain imaging is pretty new, but uh, things like MRIs, CATs, PETs, and fMRIs allow us to create images and videos of the brain and which parts of the brain are being active when they're trying to do certain tests, like uh, the ability to see a photograph or the ability to solve a puzzle. When you're solving a puzzle, which part of the brain is being active? And that's all I have for you on the brain. If you have any questions, bring them to class, and I will see you then. Have a good night. Bye-bye.